Chapter six, part four of an inquiry into the human mind on the principles of common sense. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Reynolds. An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense by Thomas Reed Chapter 6, Part 4 Section 14 Of the Laws of Vision in Brute Animals It is the intention of nature, in giving eyes to animals, that they may perceive the situation of visible objects or the direction in which they are placed. It is probable, therefore, that in ordinary cases, every animal, whether it has many eyes or few, whether of one structure or of another, sees objects single and in their true and proper direction. And since there is a prodigious variety in the structure and motions, and the number of eyes in different animals and insects, it is probable that the laws by which vision is regulated are not the same in all but various, adapted to the eyes which nature hath given them. Mankind naturally turn their eyes always the same way, so that the axis of the two eyes meet in one point. They naturally attend to or look at that object only which is placed in the point where the axes meet, and whether the object be more or less distant, the configuration of the eye is adapted to the distance of the object, so as to form a distinct picture of it. When we use our eyes in this natural way, the two pictures of the object we look at are formed upon the centers of the two retinae, and the two pictures of any contiguous object are formed upon the points of the retinae, which are similarly situate with regard to the centers. Therefore, in order to our seeing objects single and in their proper direction with two eyes, it is sufficient that we be so constituted that objects whose pictures are formed upon the center of the two retinae, or upon points similarly situated with regard to these centers, shall be seen in the same visible place. And this is the constitution which nature hath actually given to human eyes. When we distort our eyes from their parallel direction, which is an unnatural motion, but may be learned by practice, or when we direct the axes of the two eyes at one point, and at the same time direct our attention to some visible object much nearer, or much more distant than that point, which is also unnatural, yet may be learned. In these cases, and in these only, we see one object double, or two objects confounded in one. In these cases, the two pictures of the same object are formed upon the points of the retinae, which are not similarly situate, and so the object is seen double. Or the two pictures of different objects are formed upon points of the retinae which are similarly situate, and so the two objects are seen confounded in one place. Thus it appears that the laws of vision in the human constitution are wisely adapted to the natural use of human eyes, but not to that use of them which is unnatural. We see objects truly when we use our eyes in the natural way, but have false appearances presented to us when we use them in a way that is unnatural. We may reasonably think that the case is the same with other animals. But is it not unreasonable to think that those animals which naturally turn one eye towards one object, and another eye towards another object, must thereby have such false appearances presented to them as we have when we do so against nature? Many animals have their eyes by nature placed adverse and immovable, the axis of the two eyes being always directed to opposite points. Do objects painted on the centers of the two retinae appear to such animals as they do to human eyes, in one and the same visible place? I think it is highly probable that they do not and that they appear as they really are in opposite places. If we judge from analogy in this case, it will lead us to think that there is a certain correspondence between points of the two retinae in such animals, but of a different kind, 
from that which we have found in human eyes. The center of one retina will correspond with the center of the other, in such manner that the objects whose pictures are formed upon these corresponding points shall appear not to be in the same place as in human eyes, but in opposite places. And in the same manner will the superior part of one retina correspond with the inferior part of the other, and the anterior part of one with the posterior part of the other. Some animals by nature turn their eyes with equal facility, either the same way or different ways, as we turn our hands and arms. Have such animals corresponding points in their retinae, and points which do not correspond as the human kind has? I think it is probable that they have not, because such a constitution in them could serve no other purpose but to exhibit false appearances. If we judge from analogy, it will lead us to think that as such animals move their eyes in a manner similar to that in which we move our arms, they have an immediate and natural perception of the direction they give to their eyes, as we have of the direction we give to our arms, and perceive the situation of visible objects by their eyes in a manner similar to that in which we perceive the situation of tangible objects with our hands. We cannot teach brute animals to use their eyes in any other way than in which nature hath taught them, nor can we teach them to communicate to us the appearances which visible objects make to them, either in ordinary or in extraordinary cases. We have not therefore the same means of discovering the laws of vision in them as in our own kind, but must satisfy ourselves with probable conjectures and what we have said upon this subject is chiefly intended to shew that animals to which nature hath given eyes differing in their number, in their position, and in their natural motions, may very probably be subjected to different laws of vision, adapted to the peculiarities of their organs of vision. Section 15. Squinting Considered Hypothetically whether there be corresponding points in the retinae of those who have an involuntary squint, and if there are, whether they be situate in the same manner as in those who have no squint, are not questions of mere curiosity. They are of real importance to the physician who attempts the cure of a squint, and to the patient who submits to the cure. After so much has been said of the strabismus or squint, both by medical and by optical writers, one might expect to find an abundance of facts for determining these questions. Yet I confess I have been disappointed in this expectation, after taking some pains both to make observations, and to collect those which have been made by others. Nor will this appear very strange, if we consider that, to make the observations which are necessary for determining these questions, knowledge of the principles of optics and of the laws of vision must concur with opportunities rarely to be met with. Of those who squint, the far greater part have no distinct vision with one eye. When this is the case, it is impossible, and indeed of no importance, to determine the situation of the corresponding points. When both eyes are good, they commonly differ so much in their direction that the same object cannot be seen by both at the same time and in this case it will be very difficult to determine the situation of the corresponding points, for such persons will probably attend only to the objects of one eye, and the objects of the other will be as little regarded as if they were not seen. We have before observed that when we look at a near object and attend to it, we do not perceive the double appearances of more distant objects, even when they are in the same direction, and are presented to the eye at the same time. It is probable that a squinting person, when he attends to the objects of one eye, will, in like manner, have his attention totally diverted from the objects of the other, and that he will perceive them as little as we perceive the double appearances of objects when we use our eyes in the natural way. Such a person, therefore, unless he is so much a philosopher as to have acquired the habit of attending very accurately to the visible appearances of objects, and even of objects which he does not look at, will not be able to give any light to the question now under consideration. It is very probable that hares, rabbits, birds, and fishes, whose eyes are fixed in an adverse position, 
have the natural faculty of attending at the same time to visible objects placed in different and even in contrary directions, because without this faculty they could not have those advantages from the contrary direction of their eyes, which nature seems to have intended. But it is not probable that those who squint have any such natural faculty, because we find no such faculty in the rest of the species. We naturally attend to the objects placed in the point where the axes of the two eyes meet, and to them only. To give attention to an object in a different direction is unnatural, and not to be learned without pains and practice. A very convincing proof of this may be drawn from a fact well known to philosophers. When one eye is shut, there is a certain space within the field of vision where we can see nothing at all. The space which is directly opposed to that part of the bottom of the eye where the optic nerve enters. This defect of sight in one part of the eye is common to all human eyes, and hath been so from the beginning of the world. Yet it was never known until the sagacity of the Abbe Mariot discovered it in the last century. And now, when it is known, it cannot be perceived but by means of some particular experiments which require care and attention to make them succeed. What is the reason that so remarkable a defect of sight, common to all mankind, was so long unknown, and is now perceived with so much difficulty? It is surely this, that the defect is at some distance from the axis of the eye, and consequently in a part of the field of vision to which we never attend naturally and to which we cannot attend at all without the aid of some particular circumstances. From what we have said, it appears that to determine the situation of the corresponding points in the eyes of those who squint is impossible, if they do not see distinctly with both eyes, and that it will be very difficult unless the two eyes differ so little in their direction that the same object may be seen with both at the same time. Such patients I apprehend are rare, at least there are very few of them with whom I have had the fortune to meet, and therefore for the assistance of those who may have happier opportunities, and inclination to make the proper use of them, we shall consider the case of squinting hypothetically, pointing out the proper articles of inquiry, the observations that are wanted, and the conclusion that may be drawn from them. 1. It ought to be inquired whether the squinting person sees equally well with both eyes and if there be a defect in one, the nature and degree of that defect ought to be remarked. The experiments by which this may be done are so obvious that I need not mention them, but I would advise the observer to make the proper experiments, and not to rely upon the testimony of the patient, because I have found many instances, both of persons that squinted, and others, who were found upon trial to have a great defect in the sight of one eye, although they were never aware of it before. In all the following articles, it is supposed that the patient sees with both eyes so well as to be able to read with either when the other is covered. 2. It ought to be inquired whether, when one eye is covered, the other is turned directly to the object. This ought to be tried in both eyes successively. By this observation, as a touchstone, we may try the hypothesis concerning squinting, invented by M. de la Hire, and adopted by Boerhaave and many others of the medical faculty. The hypothesis is that in one eye of a squinting person the greatest sensibility, and the most distinct vision, is not, as in other men, in the centre of the retina, but upon one side of the centre, and that he turns the axis of this eye aside from the object in order that the picture of the object might fall upon the most sensible part of the retina and thereby give the most distinct vision. If this is the cause of squinting, the squinting eye will be turned aside from the object when the other eye is covered, as well as when it is not. A trial so easy to be made never was made for more than forty years, but the hypothesis was very generally received. So prone are men to invent hypotheses, and so backward to examine them by facts. At last Dr. Joran, having made the trial, found that persons who squint turn the axis of the squinting eye directly to the object, when the other eye is so covered. This fact is confirmed by Dr. Porterfield, and I have found it verified in all the instances that have fallen under my observation. 
3. It ought to be inquired whether the axes of the two eyes follow one another, so as to have always the same inclination, or make the same angle when the person looks to the right or to the left, upward or downward, or straight forward. By this observation we may judge whether a squint is owing to any defect in the muscles which move the eye, as some have supposed. In the following articles we suppose that the inclination of the axes of the eyes is found to be always the same. 4. It ought to be inquired whether the person that squints sees an object single or double. If he sees the object double, and if the two appearances have an angular distance equal to the angle which the axes of his eyes make with each other, it may be concluded that he hath corresponding points in the retinae of his eyes, and that they have the same situation as in those who have no squint. If the two appearances should have an angular distance, which is always the same, but manifestly greater or less than the angle contained under the optic axes, this would indicate corresponding points in the retinae whose situation is not the same as in those who have no squint. But it is difficult to judge accurately of the angle which the optic axes make. A squint too small to be perceived may occasion double vision of others, for if we speak strictly, every person squints more or less, whose optic axes do not meet exactly in the object which he looks at. Thus, if a man can only bring the axes of his eyes to be parallel, but cannot make them converge in the least, he must have a small squint in looking at near objects, and will see them double while he sees very distant objects single. Again, if the optic axes always converge so as to meet eight or ten feet before the face at farthest, such a person will see near objects single, but when he looks at very distant objects he will squint a little, and see them double. An instance of this kind is related by Agulonius in his Optics, who says that he has seen a young man to whom near objects appeared single, but distant objects appeared double. Dr. Briggs, in his Nova Visionis Theoria, having collected the author's several instances of double vision, quotes this from Agulonius as the most wonderful and unaccountable of all, insomuch that he suspects some imposition on the part of the young man, but to those who understand the laws of which single and double vision are regulated, it appears to be the natural effect of a very small squint. Double vision may always be owing to a small squint, when the two appearances are seen at small angular distances, although no squint was observed, and I do not remember any instances of double vision recorded by authors wherein any account is given of the angular distance of the appearances. In almost all the instances of double vision, there is reason to suspect a squint or distortion of the eyes from the concomitant circumstances, which we find to be one or the other of the following. The approach of death, or of adeliquium, excessive drinking or other intemperance, violent headache, blistering the head, smoking tobacco, blows or wounds in the head. In all these cases it is reasonable to suspect the distortion of the eyes, either from spasm or paralysis in the muscles that move them. But although it be probable that there is always a squint, greater or less, where there is double vision, yet it is certain that there is not double vision always where there is a squint. I know no instance of double vision that continued for life, or even for a great number of years. We shall therefore suppose in the following articles that the squinting person sees objects single. 5. The next inquiry then ought to be whether the object is seen with both eyes at the same time, or only with the eye whose axis is directed to it. It hath been taken for granted by the writers upon the strabismus before Dr. Jorin that those who squint commonly see objects single with both eyes at the same time but I know not one fact advanced by any writer which proves it. Dr. Jorin is of a contrary opinion, and as it is of consequence, so it is very easy to determine this point in particular instances, by this obvious experiment. While the person that squints looks steadily at an object, let the observer carefully remark the direction of both his eyes, and observe their motions, and let an opaque body be interposed between the object and the two eyes successively. If the patient, notwithstanding this interposition, and without changing the direction of the eyes, 
continues to see the object all the time, it may be concluded that he saw it with both eyes at once. But if the interposition of the body between one eye and the object makes it disappear, then we may be certain that it was seen by that eye only. In the two following articles we shall suppose the first to happen, according to the common hypothesis. 6. Upon this supposition it ought to be inquired whether the patient sees an object double in those circumstances wherein it appears double to them who have no squint. Let him, for instance, place a candle at the distance of ten feet, and, holding his finger at arm's length between him and the candle, let him observe when he looks at the candle whether he sees his finger with both eyes, and whether he sees it single or double. And when he looks at his finger, let him observe whether he sees the candle with both eyes, and whether single or double. By this observation it may be determined whether to this patient the phenomena of double as well as of single vision are the same as to them who have no squint. If they are not the same, if he sees the objects single with two eyes, not only in the cases wherein they appear single, but in those also wherein they appear double to other men, the conclusion to be drawn from this supposition is that his single vision does not arise from corresponding points in the retinae of his eyes, and that the laws of vision are not the same in him as in the rest of mankind. 7. If, on the other hand, he sees objects double in those cases wherein they appear double to others, the conclusion must be that he hath corresponding points in the retinae of his eyes, but unnaturally situate, and their situation may be thus determined. When he looks at an object having the axis of one eye directed to it, and the axis of the other turned aside from it, let us suppose a right line to pass from the object through the center of the diverging eye. We shall, for the sake of perspicuity, call this right line the natural axis of the eye, and it will make an angle with the real axis greater or less according as his squint is greater or less. We shall also call that point of the retina in which the natural axis cuts it the natural center of the retina, which will be more or less distant from the real center, according as the squint is greater or less. Having premised these definitions, it will be evident to those who understand the principles of optics that in this person the natural center of one retina corresponds with the real center of the other, in the very same manner as the two real centers correspond in perfect eyes, and that the points similarly situate with regard to the real center in one retina and the natural center in the other do likewise correspond in the same manner as the points similarly situate with regard to the two real centers, correspond in perfect eyes. If it is true, as has been commonly affirmed, that one who squints sees an object with both eyes at the same time, and yet sees it single, the squint will most probably be such as we have described in this article. And we may further conclude that if a person affected with such a squint, as we have supposed, could be brought to the habit of looking straight, his sight would thereby be greatly hurt for he would then see everything double, which he saw with both eyes at the same time, and objects distant from one another would appear to be confounded together. His eyes are made for squinting, as much as those of other men are made for looking straight, and his sight would be no less injured by looking straight than that of another man by squinting. He can never see perfectly when he does not squint, unless the corresponding points of his eyes should by custom change their place, but how small the probability of this is will appear in the seventeenth section. Those of the medical faculty who attempt the cure of a squint would do well to consider whether it is attended with such symptoms as are above described. If it is, the cure would be worse than the malady, for every one will readily acknowledge that it is better to put up with the deformity of a squint than to purchase the cure by the loss of perfect and distinct vision. 8. We shall now return to Dr. Jorin's hypothesis, and suppose that our patient, when he saw objects single notwithstanding his squint, was found upon trial to have seen them only with one eye. We would advise such a patient to endeavor by repeated efforts to lessen his squint, and to bring the axes of his eyes nearer to a parallel direction. 
We have naturally the power of making small variations in the inclination of the optic axes, and this power may be greatly increased by exercise. In the ordinary and natural use of our eyes, we can direct their axes to a fixed star. In this case they must be parallel. We can direct them also to an object six inches distant from the eye, and in this case the axes must make an angle of fifteen or twenty degrees. We see young people in their frolics learn to squint, making their eyes converge or diverge, when they will, to a very considerable degree. Why should it be more difficult for a squinting person to learn to look straight when he pleases? If once by an effort of his will he can but lessen his squint, frequent practice will make it easy to lessen it, and will daily increase his power, so that if he begins this practice in youth and perseveres in it, he may probably, after some time, learn to direct both his eyes to one object. When he hath acquired this power, it will be no difficult matter to determine by proper observations whether the centers of the retinae, and other points similarly situate with regard to the centers, correspond as in other men. 9. Let us now suppose that he finds this to be the case, and that he sees an object single with both eyes, when the axes of both are directed to it. It will then concern him to acquire the habit of looking straight, as he hath got the power, because he will thereby not only remove a deformity, but improve his sight. And I conceive this habit, like all others, may be got by frequent exercise. He may practice before a mirror when alone, and in company he ought to have those about him who will observe and admonish him when he squints. 10. What is supposed in the ninth article is not merely imaginary. It is really the case of some squinting persons, as will appear in the next section. Therefore it ought further to be inquired how it comes to pass that such a person sees an object which he looks at only with one eye when both are open. In order to answer this question, it may be observed first whether when he looks at an object the diverging eye is not drawn so close to the nose that it can have no distinct images or, secondly, whether the pupil of the diverging eye is not covered wholly or in part by the upper eyelid. Dr. Joran observed instances of these cases in persons that squinted, and assigns them as causes of their seeing the object only with one eye. Thirdly, it may be observed whether the diverging eye is not so directed that the picture of the object falls upon that part of the retina where the optic nerve enters and where there is no vision. This will probably happen in a squint wherein the axes of the eyes converge so as to meet about six inches before the nose. 11. In the last place, it ought to be inquired whether such a person hath any distinct vision at all, with the diverging eye, at the time he is looking at an object with the other. It may seem very improbable that he should be able to read with the diverging eye when the other is covered and yet, when both are open, have no distinct vision with it at all. But this, perhaps, will not appear so improbable, if the following considerations are duly attended to. Let us suppose that one who saw perfectly gets, by a blow on the head or some other accident, a permanent and involuntary squint. According to the laws of vision, he will see objects double, and will see objects distant from one another confounded together, but such vision being very disagreeable, as well as inconvenient, he will do everything in his power to remedy it. For alleviating such distresses, nature often teaches men wonderful experiments, which the sagacity of a philosopher would be unable to discover. Every accidental motion, every direction or confirmation of his eyes, which lessens the evil, will be agreeable. It will be repeated until it be learned to perfection, and become habitual even without thought or design. Now, in this case, what disturbs the sight of one eye is the sight of the other, and all the disagreeable appearances in vision would cease if the light of one eye was extinct. The sight of one eye will become more distinct and more agreeable in the same proportion as that of the other becomes faint and indistinct. It may, therefore, be expected that every habit will, by degrees, be acquired which tends to destroy distinct vision in one eye, while it preserves it in the other. 
These habits will be greatly facilitated if one eye was at first better than the other, for in that case the best eye will always be directed to the object which he intends to look at, and every habit will be acquired which tends to hinder his seeing at all, or seeing it distinctly by the other at the same time. I shall mention one or two habits that may probably be acquired in such a case. Perhaps there are others which we cannot so easily conjecture. First, by a small increase or diminution of his squint, he may bring it to correspond with one or other of the cases mentioned in the last article. Secondly, the diverging eye may be brought to such a conformation as to be extremely short-sighted, and consequently to have no distinct vision of objects at a distance. I knew this to be the case of one person that squinted, but cannot say whether the short-sightedness of the diverging eye was original or acquired by habit. We see, therefore, that one who squints and originally saw objects double by reason of that squint, may acquire such habits that when he looks at an object he shall see it only with one eye. Nay, he may acquire such habits that when he looks at an object with his best eye he shall have no distinct vision with the other at all. Whether this is really the case, being unable to determine in the instances that have fallen under my observation, I shall leave to future inquiry. I have endeavoured in the foregoing article to delineate such a process as is proper in observing the phenomena of squinting. I know well by experience that this process appears more easy in theory than it will be found to be in practice, and that in order to carry it on with success, some qualifications of mind are necessary in the patient, which are not always to be met with. But if those who have proper opportunities and inclination to observe such phenomena attend duly to this process, they may be able to furnish facts less vague and uninstructive than those we meet with, even in authors of reputation. By such facts vain theories may be exploded, and our knowledge of the laws of nature, which regard the noblest of our senses, enlarged. Section 16 facts related to squinting having considered the phenomena of squinting hypothetically and their connection with corresponding points in the retina i shall now mention the facts i have had occasion to observe myself or have met with in authors that can give any light to this subject having examined above twenty persons that squinted i found in all of them a defect in the sight of one eye four only had so much of distinct vision in the weak eye as to be able to read with it when the other was covered the rest saw nothing at all distinctly with one eye dr porterfield says that this is generally the case of people that squint and i suspect it is so more generally than is commonly imagined dr jurin in a very judicious dissertation upon squinting printed in dr smith's optics observes that those who squint and see objects with both eyes never see the same object with both eyes at the same time, that when one eye is directed straight forward to an object, the other is drawn so close to the nose that the object cannot at all be seen by it, the images being too oblique and too indistinct to affect the eye. In some squinting persons he observed the diverging eye drawn under the upper eyelid, while the other was directed to the object. From these observations he concludes that the eye is thus distorted not for the sake of seeing better with it, but rather to avoid seeing at all with it as much as possible. From all the observations he had made, he was satisfied that there is nothing peculiar in the structure of a squinting eye, that the fault is only in its wrong direction, and that this wrong direction is got by habit. Therefore he proposes that method of cure which we have described in the eighth and ninth articles of the last section. He tells us that he had attempted a cure after this method upon a young gentleman with promising hopes of success, but was interrupted by his falling ill of the smallpox, of which he died. It were to be wished that Dr. Juran had acquainted us whether he ever brought the young man to direct the axes of both eyes to the same object and whether in that case he saw the object single, and saw it with both eyes, and that he had likewise acquainted us whether he saw objects double when his squint was diminished. But as to these facts he is silent. 
I wished long for an opportunity of trying Dr. Jorin's method of curing a squint, without finding one. Having always, upon examination, discovered so great a defect in the sight of one eye of the patient, as discouraged the attempt. But I have lately found three young gentlemen, of whom I am hopeful this method may have success, if they have patience and perseverance in using it. Two of them are brothers, and, before I had access to examine them, had been practicing this method by the direction of their tutor, with much success, that the elder looks straight when he is upon his guard. The younger can direct both his eyes to one object, but they soon return to their usual squint. A third young gentleman, who had never heard of this method before, by a few days' practice, was able to direct both his eyes to one object, but could not keep them long in that direction. All the three agree in this, that when both eyes are directed to one object, they see it and the adjacent objects single. But when they squint, they see objects sometimes single and sometimes double. I observed of all the three that when they squinted most, that is, in the way they had been accustomed to, the axes of their eyes converged so as to meet five or six inches before the nose. It is probable that in this case the picture of the object in the diverging eye must fall upon that part of the retina where the optic nerve enters, and therefore the object could not be seen by that eye. All the three have some defect in the sight of one eye, which none of them knew, until I put them upon making trials, and when they squint the best eye is always directed to the object, and the weak eye is that which diverges from it. But when the best eye is covered, the weak eye is turned directly to the object. Whether this defect of sight in one eye be the effect of its having been long disused, as it must have been when they squinted, or whether some original defect in one eye might be the occasion of their squinting, time may discover. The two brothers have found the sight of the weak eye improved by using to read with it, while the other is covered. The elder can read an ordinary print with the weak eye. The other, as well as the third gentleman, can only read large print with the weak eye. I have met with one other person only who squinted, and yet could read large print with the weak eye. He is a young man, whose eyes are both tender and weak-sighted, but the left much weaker than the right. When he looks at any object, he always directs the right eye to it, and then the left is turned toward the nose so much that it is impossible for him to see the same object with both eyes at the same time. When the right eye is covered, he turns the left directly to the object, but he sees it indistinctly, and as if it had a mist about it. I made several experiments, some of them in the company and with the assistance of an ingenious physician, in order to discover whether objects that were in the axes of the two eyes were seen in one place confounded together, as in those who have no involuntary squint. The object placed in the axes of the weak eye was a lighted candle, at the distance of eight or ten feet. Before the other eye was placed a printed book, at such a distance as he could read upon it. He said that while he read upon the book, he saw the candle, but very faintly. And, from what we could learn, these two objects did not appear in one place, but had all that angular distance in appearance which they had in reality. If this was really the case, the conclusion to be drawn from it is that the corresponding points in his eyes are not situate in the same manner as in other men, and that if he could be brought to direct both eyes to one object, he would see it double. But considering that the young man had never been accustomed to observations of this kind, and that the sight of one eye was so imperfect, I do not pretend to draw this conclusion with certainty from this single instance. All that can be inferred from these facts is that of four persons who squint, three appear to have nothing preternatural in the structure of their eyes. The centers of the retini, and the points similarly situate with regard to the centers, do certainly correspond in the same manner as in other men, so that if they can be brought to the habit of directing their eyes right to an object, they will not only remove a deformity, but improve their sight. With regard to the fourth, the case is dubious, with some probability of a deviation from the usual course of nature in the situation of the corresponding points of his eyes. Section 17. 
of the effect of custom in seeing objects single. It appears from the phenomena of single and double vision, recited in section 13, that our seeing an object single with two eyes depends upon these two things. First, upon that mutual correspondence of certain points of the retina, which we have often described. Secondly, upon the two eyes being directed to the object so accurately that the two images of it fall upon corresponding points. These two things must concur in order to our seeing an object single with two eyes, and as far as they depend upon custom, so far only can single vision depend upon custom. With regard to the second, that is, the accurate direction of both eyes to the object, I think it must be acknowledged that this is only learned by custom. Nature hath wisely ordained the eyes to move in such a manner that their axes shall always be nearly parallel, but hath left it in our power to vary their inclination a little, according to the distance of the object we look at. Without this power, objects would appear single at one particular distance only, and at distances much less or much greater, would always appear double. The wisdom of nature is conspicuous in giving us this power, and no less conspicuous in making the extent of it exactly adequate to the end. The parallelism of the eyes, in general, is therefore the work of nature, but that precise and accurate direction, which must be varied according to the distance of the object, is the effect of custom. The power which nature hath left us of varying the inclination of the optic axes a little, is turned into a habit of giving them always that inclination, which is adapted to the distance of the object. But it may be asked, what gives rise to this habit? The only answer that can be given to this question is, that it is found necessary to perfect and distinct vision. A man who hath lost the sight of one eye, very often loses the habit of directing it exactly to the object he looks at, because that habit is no longer of use to him. And if he should recover the sight of his eye, he would recover this habit by finding it useful. No part of the human constitution is more admirable than that whereby we acquire habits which are found useful without any design or intention. Children must see imperfectly at first, but by using their eyes they learn to use them in the best manner, and acquire without intending it the habits necessary for that purpose. Every man becomes most expert in that kind of vision which is most useful to him in his particular profession and manner of life. A miniature painter, or an engraver, sees very near objects better than a sailor, but the sailor sees very distant objects much better than they. A person that is short-sighted, in looking at distant objects, gets the habit of contracting the aperture of his eyes by almost closing his eyelids. Why? For no other reason but because this makes him see the object more distinct. In like manner, the reason why every man acquires the habit of directing both eyes accurately to the object must be because thereby he sees it more perfectly and distinctly. It remains to be considered whether that correspondence between certain points of the retinae, which is likewise necessary to single vision, be the effect of custom or an original property of human eyes. A strong argument for its being an original property may be drawn from the habit just now mentioned of directing the eyes accurately to an object. This habit is got by our finding it necessary to perfect and distinct vision. But why is it necessary? For no other reason but this, because thereby the two images of the object, falling upon corresponding points, the eyes assist each other in vision, and the object is seen better by both together than it could be by one. But when the eyes are not accurately directed, the two images of an object fall upon points that do not correspond, whereby the sight of one eye disturbs the sight of the other, and the object is seen more indistinctly with both eyes than it would be with one. Whence it is reasonable to conclude that this correspondence of certain points of the retinae is prior to the habits we acquire in vision, and, consequently, is natural and original. We have all acquired the habit of directing our eyes always in a particular manner, which causes single vision. Now, if nature hath ordained that we should have single vision only, when our eyes are thus directed, there is an obvious reason why all mankind should agree in the habit of directing them in this manner. 
but if single vision is the effect of custom, any other habit of directing the eyes would have answered the purpose, and no account can be given why this particular habit should be so universal. And it must appear very strange that no one instance hath been found of a person who had acquired the habit of seeing objects single with both eyes, while they were directed in any other manner. The judicious Dr. Smith, in his excellent system of optics, maintains the contrary opinion, and offers some reasonings and facts in proof of it. He agrees with Bishop Barclay in attributing it entirely to custom, that we see objects single with two eyes, as well as that we see objects erect by inverted images. Having considered Bishop Barclay's reasoning in the eleventh section, we shall now beg leave to make some remarks on what Dr. Smith hath said upon this subject, quid the respect due to an author to whom the world owes, not only many valuable discoveries of his own, but those of the brightest mathematical genius of this age, which, with great labor, he generously redeemed from oblivion. He observes that the question, why we see objects single with two eyes, is of the same sort with this, why we hear sounds single with two ears, and that the same answer must serve both. The inference intended to be drawn from this observation is, that as the second of these phenomena is the effect of custom, so likewise is the first. Now I humbly conceive that the questions are not so much of the same sort, that the same answer must serve for both, and moreover that our hearing single with two ears is not the effect of custom. Two or more visible objects, although perfectly similar and seen at the very same time, may be distinguished by their visible places. But two sounds, perfectly similar, and heard at the same time, cannot be distinguished, for, from the nature of sound, the sensations they occasion must coalesce in one and lose all distinction. If, therefore, it is asked why we hear sounds single with two ears, I answer, not from custom, but because two sounds which are perfectly like and synchronous have nothing by which they can be distinguished. But will this answer fit the other question? I think not. The object makes an appearance to each eye, as the sound makes an impression upon each ear, so far the two senses agree. But the visible appearances may be distinguished by place, when perfectly like in other respects. The sounds cannot be thus distinguished, and herein the two senses differ. Indeed, if the two appearances have the same visible place, they are, in that case, as incapable of distinction as the sounds were, and we see the object single. But when they have not the same visible place, they are perfectly distinguishable, and we see the object double. We see the object single only when the eyes are directed in one particular manner, while there are many other ways of directing them within the sphere of our power by which we see the object double. Dr. Smith justly attributes to custom that well-known fallacy in feeling, whereby a button pressed with two opposite sides of two continuous fingers, laid across it, is felt double. I agree with him that the cause of this appearance is that those opposite sides of the fingers have never been used to feel the same object, but two different objects at the same time. And I beg leave to add that as custom produces this phenomenon, so a contrary custom destroys it. For if a man frequently accustoms to himself to feel the buttons with his fingers across it, it will at last be felt single, as I have found by experience. It may be taken for a general rule that things which are produced by custom may be undone or changed by disuse, or by a contrary custom. On the other hand, it is a strong argument that an effect is not owing to custom, but to the constitution of nature, when a contrary custom, long continued, is found neither to change nor weaken it. I take this to be the best rule by which we can determine the question presently under consideration. I shall therefore mention two facts brought by Dr. Smith to prove that the corresponding points of the retinae have been changed by custom, and then I shall mention some facts tending to prove that there are corresponding points of the retinae of the eyes originally, and that custom produces no change in them. One fact related upon the authority of Martin Folk, Esquire, who was informed by Dr. Hepburn of Lim that the Reverend Mr. Foster of Clinchwharton, 
in that neighborhood having been blind for some years of a gutta serena was restored to sight by salivation and that upon his first beginning to see all objects appeared to him double but afterwards the two appearances approached by degrees he came at last to see single and as distinctly as he did before he was blind Upon this case I observe first that it does not prove any change in the corresponding points of the eyes, unless we suppose, what is not affirmed, that Mr. Foster directed his eyes to the object at first, when he saw double, with the same accuracy, and in the same manner that he did afterwards, when he saw single. Secondly, if we should suppose this, no account can be given why at first the two appearances should be seen at one certain angular distance, rather than another, or why this angular distance should gradually decrease, until at last the appearances coincided. How could this effect be produced by custom? But thirdly, every circumstance of this case may be accounted for, on the supposition that Mr. Foster had corresponding points in the retinae of his eyes, from the time he began to see, and that custom made no change with regard to them. We need only further suppose, what is common in such cases, that by some years' blindness he had lost the habit of directing his eyes accurately to an object, and that he gradually recovered this habit when he came to see. The second fact mentioned by Dr. Smith is taken from Mr. Chelsden's anatomy, and is this. A gentleman who from a blow on the head had one eye distorted, found every object appear double, but by degree the most familiar ones became single and in time all objects became so, without any amendment of the distortion. I observe here that it is not said that the two appearances gradually approached and at last united, without any amendment of the distortion. This would indeed have been a decisive proof of a change in the corresponding points of the retinae, and yet of such a change as could not be accounted for from custom. But this is not said, and if it had been observed, a circumstance so remarkable would have been mentioned by Mr. Chelsden, as it was in the other case by Mr. Hepburn. We may therefore take it for granted that one of the appearances vanished by degrees without approaching to the other, and this, I conceive, might happen several ways. First, the sight of the distorted eye might gradually decay by the curt, so that appearances presented by that eye would gradually vanish. Secondly, a small and unperceived change in the manner of directing the eyes might occasion his not seeing the object with the distorted eye, as appears from section 15, article 10. Thirdly, by acquiring the habit of directing one and the same eye always to the object, the faint and oblique appearance presented by the other eye might be so little attended to when it became familiar as not to be perceived. One of these causes, or more of them concurring, might produce the effect mentioned, without any change of the corresponding points of the eyes. For these reasons, the facts mentioned by Dr. Smith, although curious, seem not to be decisive. The following facts ought to be put in the opposite scale. First, in the famous case of the young gentleman couched by Mr. Chelsden, after having had cataracts on both his eyes until he was thirteen years of age, it appears that he saw objects single from the time he began to see with both eyes. Mr. Chilsden's words are, And now, being lately couched of his other eye, he says that objects at first appeared large to this eye, but not so large as they did at first to the other. And looking upon the same object with both eyes, he thought it looked about twice as large as with the first couched eye only, but not double, that we can anywise discover. Secondly, the three young gentlemen mentioned in the last section, who had acquired as far as I know from infancy, as soon as they learned to direct both eyes to an object, saw it single. In these four cases it appears evident that the senders of the retina corresponded originally and before custom could produce any such effect. For Mr. Chesselton's young gentleman had never been so accustomed to see at all before he was couched, and the other three had never been accustomed to direct the axes of both eyes to the object. Thirdly, from the facts recited in section 13, it appears that from the time we are capable of observing the phenomena of single and double vision, custom makes no change in them. 
I have amused myself with such observations for more than thirty years, and in every case wherein I saw the object double at first, I see it to this day notwithstanding the constant experience of its being single. In other cases where I know there are two objects, there appears only one, after thousands of experiments. Let a man look at a familiar object through a polyhedron, or multiplying glass, every hour of his life. The number of visible appearances will be the same at last as at first, nor does any number of experiments or length of time make the least change. Effects produced by habit must vary according as the acts by which the habit is acquired are more or less frequent. But the phenomena of single and double vision are so invariable and uniform in all men, are so exactly regulated by mathematical rules, that I think we have good reason to conclude that they are not the effect of custom, but of fixed and immutable laws of nature. Section 18 of Dr. Porterfield's Account of Single and Double Vision Bishop Barclay and Dr. Smith seem to attribute too much to custom in vision, Dr. Porterfield too little. This ingenious writer thinks that, by an original law of our nature, antecedent to custom and experience, we perceive visible objects in their true place, not only as to their direction, but likewise as to their distance from the eye, and therefore he accounts for our seeing objects single with two eyes in this manner. Having the faculty of perceiving the object with each eye in its true place, we must perceive it with both eyes in the same place, and consequently must perceive it single. He is aware that this principle, although it accounts for our seeing objects single with two eyes, yet does not at all account for our seeing objects double, and whereas other writers on this subject take it to be a sufficient cause for double vision that we have two eyes, and only find it difficult to assign a cause for single vision, on the contrary, Dr. Porterfield's principle throws all the difficulty on the other side. Therefore, in order to account for the phenomena of double vision, he advances another principle without signifying whether he conceives it to be an original law of our nature, or the effect of custom. It is that our natural perception of the distance of objects from the eye is not extended to all the objects that fall within the field of vision, but limited to that which we directly look at, and that the circumjacent objects, whatever be their real distance, are seen at the same distance with the object we look at, as if they were all in the surface of a sphere whereof the eye is the centre. Thus single vision is accounted for by our seeing the true distance of an object which we look at, and double vision by a false appearance of distance in objects which we do not directly look at. We agree with this learned and ingenious author that it is by a natural and original principle that we see visible objects in a certain direction from the eye, and honor him as the author of this discovery. But we cannot assent to either of those principles by which he explains single and double vision, for the following reasons. 1. Our having natural and original perception of the distance of objects from the eye appears contrary to a well-attested fact. For the young gentleman couched by Mr. Cheselden imagined at first that whatever he saw touched his eye, as what he felt touched his hand. 2. The perception we have of the distance of objects from the eye, whether it be from nature or custom, is not so accurate and determinate as is necessary to produce single vision. A mistake of the twentieth or thirtieth part of the distance of a small object, such as a pin, ought, according to Dr. Portersfield's hypothesis, to make it appear double. Very few can judge of the distance of a visible object with such accuracy. Yet we never find double vision produced by mistaking the distance of the object. There are many cases in vision, even with the naked eye, wherein we mistake the distance of an object by one half or more. Why do we see such objects single? When I move my spectacles from my eye towards a small object, two or three feet distant, the object seems to approach so as to be seen at last at about half its real distance. But it is seen single at that apparent distance, as well as when we see it with the naked eye at its real distance. And when we look at an object with a binocular telescope, 
properly fitted to the eyes, we see it single, while it appears fifteen or twenty times nearer than it is. There are then few cases wherein the distance of an object from the eye is seen so accurately as is necessary for single vision upon this hypothesis. This seems to be a conclusive argument against the account given of single vision. We find likewise that false judgments or fallacious appearances of the distance of an object do not produce double vision. This seems to be a conclusive argument against the account given of double vision. 3. The perception we have of the linear distance of objects seems to be wholly the effect of experience. This, I think, hath been proved by Bishop Barclay and by Dr. Smith. And when we come to point out the means of judging of distance by sight, it will appear that they are all furnished by experience. 4. Supposing that by a law of our nature the distance of objects from the eye were perceived most accurately, as well as their direction, it will not follow that we must see the object single. Let us consider what means such a law of nature would furnish for resolving the question whether the objects of the two eyes are in one and the same place, and consequently are not two but one. Suppose, then, two right lines, one drawn from the center of one eye to its object, the other drawn in like manner from the center of the other eye to its object. This law of nature gives us the direction or position of each of these right lines, and the length of each, and this is all that it gives. These are geometrical data, and we may learn from geometry what is determined by their means. Is it then determined by these data, whether the two right lines terminate in one and the same point or not? No, truly. In order to determine this, we must have three other data. We must know whether the two right lines are in one plane. We must know what angle they make, and we must know the distance between the centers of the eyes. And when these things are known, we must apply the rules of trigonometry before we can resolve the question whether the objects of the two eyes are in one and the same place, and consequently whether they are two or one. 5. The false appearance of distance into which double vision is resolved cannot be the effect of custom, for constant experience contradicts it. Neither hath it the features of a law of nature, because it does not answer any good purpose nor indeed any purpose at all but deceive us. But why should we seek for arguments in a question concerning what appears to us or does not appear? The question is, at what distance do the objects now in my eye appear? Do they all appear at one distance, as if placed in the concave surface of a sphere, the eye being in the center? Every man surely may know this with certainty, and if he will but give attention to the testimony of his eyes, needs not ask a philosopher, how visible objects appear to him. Now, it is very true that if I look up to a star in the heavens, the other stars that appear at the same time do appear in this manner. Yet this phenomenon does not favor Dr. Porterfield's hypothesis, for the stars and heavenly bodies do not appear at their true distances when we look directly to them any more than when they are seen obliquely. And if this phenomenon be an argument for Dr. Porterfield's second principle, it must destroy the first. The true cause of this phenomenon will be given afterwards. Therefore, setting it aside for the present, let us put another case. I sit in my room and direct my eyes to the door, which appears to be about sixteen feet distant. At the same time I see many other objects, faintly and obliquely, the floor, the floor cloth, the table which I write upon, papers, standish, candle, and etc., now, do all these objects appear at the same distance of sixteen feet upon the closest attention? I find they do not. End of chapter 6, part 4 Recording by Stephen Reynolds, Durham, Connecticut